In July of 2015, a new online shopping company launched with a plan to upend Amazon's hold on e-commerce. Amazon is dealing with new competition this morning. Jet.com is a membership-only site, but Tuesday's launch came with a free trial period. Jet is already selling more than four and a half million products. I think there was a ton of excitement. That's Jason Del Rey. He's a business journalist, and he's covered retail for many years. He wrote a book called Winner Sells All, Amazon, Walmart, and the Battle for Our Wallets. I think there was a real feeling that if you were a young professional in the tech industry working on the East Coast, like, this was kind of the place to be. I think executives were excited too, but also really nervous about this idea. I mean... Yes, they had raised hundreds of millions of dollars, but that, like Mark Laurie had done that before, and so that didn't mean it was actually a good idea. Mark Laurie was the founder behind Jet.com. He was known in retail and startup circles. He'd founded companies before and raised plenty of money. And with Jet, he set out to create a company that would compete with Amazon on just about every level. Price, product selection, and fast delivery. And what's interesting about this is they don't have as many products as Amazon. They actually are going to have somewhat slower delivery than Amazon, but they are going head to head with Amazon. About a week before Jet.com is set to launch, Amazon hosts something called Prime Day. It's a one day shopping bonanza to celebrate the company's 20th anniversary, complete with discounts that rivaled its Black Friday sales. I think that what most people don't realize is that this isn't just a discount promotion sort of in the middle of the summer to revive a you know, sort of summer doldrums. This was a targeted attack on brick and mortar <clears throat> companies, retailers, to get people to join Prime. A targeted attack on brick and mortar and a moment that caused some freaking out inside Jet. At the executive level specifically, they were kind of like, what the fuck? I mean, Amazon knew Jet was coming because there was a lot of press about it. And some people thought, man, maybe the timing is just to screw with us. So people were worried. The other thing people found uh, before the public launch, but just the testing, was that Amazon's pricing algorithm and price tracking systems that they have were matching Jet's prices, you know, almost instantaneously. And one executive at Jet told me, You know, that would have made sense if we, you know, were selling billions of dollars a year. Like, of course, but we hadn't really even launched publicly. Like, why? Like, it seemed like they really were out to get us. You know, Mark was making a lot of noise about how they were going to take on Amazon. And this was a new way that was better to shop. And so, as Amazon executives told me, you know, they were forced to take him very seriously. This was the backdrop against which the Upstart Jet officially opened its virtual doors to customers in the summer of 2015. And on that first day, in the company's Hoboken, New Jersey headquarters, there was the screen listing the sales in real time. So that thing is going crazy. I think there was a bet over how much first day sales would be. I think Mark Laurie's guess maybe was $700,000 in day one sales. And... It ended up being well over a million. But then the people who know, like, the way (laughs) the the sausage is being made are are suddenly very, very nervous. And um, they end up basically barring people from all throughout their own corporate teams just to place orders to have enough inventory. A little more than a year after the site's launch, Lori and his team would be scooped up by another kind of retail giant, one that was also vying for the chance to go head-to-head with the Bezos empire. That company was Walmart. This is The Closer. I'm Amy Keene. We're back for a brand new season of stories about deals that change the world. Today, how Jet became Walmart's hope for e-commerce. That's after the break. The man at the center of our story is Mark Laurie. In some ways, Mark Laurie is an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. He loved to hustle and he loved to be around a team of people that he was leading. And 
he really wanted to be rich, too. I mean, his his upbringing, uh, you know, he grew up in Staten Island, New York, and then New Jersey, and he had this goal of, I forget the exact numbers, but by 28, making X amount of money, by 38, making this amount, 48, this amount, and he ended up, you know, beating all those yeah. uh, goals. You describe him as ambitious, but also soft-spoken and conflict-avoidant, which I think is an interesting combination of personality traits in somebody who is ultimately after a huge payday. He absolutely is conflict-avoidant, but when he had a vision for something, he was hell-bent on making you believe that vision, too. But on the other hand, you know, he, he would find over his career that uh, there were times where he needed to sort of be a hard ass and really hated those times. And as someone who would end up working inside Amazon, like, if you can't be a hard ass, you're probably not going to last long. Lori's first major encounter with the e-commerce giant came after he and his childhood friend started a site called Diapers.com in 2005. Here at Diapers.com, we offer fast, free, one to two day shipping on orders over $35, making it easier than ever to raise a baby. Now all that's left is helping you make the baby. It's magic time. Which in the early 2000s in New York and I believe San Francisco really was kind of beating Amazon in terms of, you know, selling diapers and other baby products to busy parents over the internet and having them delivered very, very quickly. Well, two childhood friends obsessed with Amazon.com have started a company that is giving the e-commerce giant a run for its money less than six years ago. The focus was basically growth of sales above all else and also amazing customer service. Okay, so as you're doing all of this and as you're growing, have you guys thought about your exit strategy? I mean, what if Amazon came knocking on your door and said, you know what, rather than compete with you, we're just going to buy you? Yeah, I mean, right now we're just, you know, head down, building our business, not really thinking about that. Um, we're just trying to, to do the right thing for the customer right now. And so Amazon eventually pays attention to this company because, you know, for many retailers, Doing well in baby products and diapers is very important because you, you can gain customers for life at that point. They see this company growing really quickly, starts getting nervous about this company, starts talking about ways they can crush this company. You know, famously in the industry, they start cutting the price of diapers by 30%, which is unheard of. Mark and his founder are in a really tough spot because it's having an impact on their business. And so they basically, they have to decide, can they raise more venture cap capital or should they consider selling? And they decide to consider selling and Walmart and Amazon are basically the two companies most intrigued and most interested in buying Quidzy. Quidzy being diapers.com's parent company. In this bid, Amazon wins. Lori and his co-founder sell Quidzy for about $550 million and end up working for the Seattle-based tech company. But the internal culture doesn't sit well with Lori, and within a few years, he leaves. So you hear different versions of what happened, and, you know, so there was one side, the other side, and then probably the truth somewhere in the middle. He basically wants, like, a happy family in the workplace, and that is not. Amazon. I think on the other hand, he also has talked about really believing that they would give him the marketing muscle, the marketing dollars to continue to grow the diapers.com brand in a big way. In fact, they ended up competing kind of against amazon.com proper. So I think that was another layer. But truthfully, I, I kind of just think he wanted to start another company too. And while he was made quite wealthy, he and his co-founder tens of millions of dollars each by this sale, I think there was a part of him that wanted to build something more sustainable. So Lori gets to work on his next big thing, which ends up being another e-commerce idea, this one called Jet.com. What was the pitch for this business? The initial pitch was, you will pay a membership fee as a customer like you do to Costco. And in exchange for that, you will get the lowest prices anywhere on the internet for 
merchandise from diapers to toys to apparel. Yeah, I like to think of it as Amazon meets Costco because it's a membership discounting website, okay? Um, They described it internally as, I think, if Costco and Amazon had a baby. And so you would pay the Costco-like membership fee and have the breadth of selection of an Amazon, but at the lower prices that you would get at a Costco in exchange for that fee. And, you know, what they were trying to do was, as Mark told many people, strip costs out of the supply chain. And by that, they thought there were better ways to ship products to customers where the products would come at from warehouses closer to you, where every item in that order would come from a single warehouse and that there are savings there they would then pass on to customers. They eventually created something called the smart cart. As you added more things to your cart, the price on your order would lower. Yeah, rewarding the customer for grabbing things that are perhaps in that same warehouse that'll make it easier on the back end for Jet to actually ship that out. That was the idea. So it did not work that way to start at Jet.com, and it was not clear to customers what was going on. But this is what was going on. They had this problem, they called it the cold start problem, which was they weren't going to buy inventory for every product on the web, but they wanted to market every product on the web to you and let you buy it even if they weren't, you know, even if they didn't have it in stock themselves. And so they were actually buying items from other retailers and having those items sent directly to the Jet customer. And you thought it was from Jet.com. You put your credit card into Jet.com. And in fact, it was coming from, in many cases, Walmart. Uh, in other cases, other retailers, you might scratch your head and say, well, how do the how does the money work? How does the economics work on that? And the answer is it for Jet, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't it doesn't work. There were a core group of products that they did have in their own warehouse. Those were sure. consumable products, stuff that customers would buy very frequently. Diapers, tissues, you know, soap, deodorant, that kind of stuff. But for apparel, for electronics, all that stuff was coming from other retailers behind the scenes, and it was not known to the customer, and they were losing a ton of money on this. The plan for Jet was that it would strip out all of these costs in the retail supply chain. But what was really happening, at least at the time of launch, was that they just ate the costs themselves. This problem was compounded by the fact that the site got a lot of attention when it launched, including on a national morning show. This morning, there's a new option for online shoppers. Jet.com, which launched at midnight, is hoping to rival retail giants Amazon and Walmart as the cheapest web retailer. So the demand, I think, was it was it far exceeded what they expected. A warehouse manager told me they were keeping inventory outside because they had no more room inside the warehouse. Like, you know, sort of a great problem to have in some ways, but also kind of a cluster. This was the same launch day where CEO Mark Laurie bet the company would do 700000 in sales, and the company ends up doing well over a million dollars. So now the site is, you know, the site is a going concern. It's open. There's more demand than expected. But still a really big expense for Lori is advertising. He's spending tens of millions of dollars, I think a month, yep. to promote the service. Behind the scenes, he's got just about everybody in the company working to try to replenish stock, get it from different retailers that they don't yet have partnerships with. Then they start to get some bad press coverage about how they operate and Crucially, a lot of the retailers whose product Jet is selling realize they're selling our product. We have no partnership here. So so what happens there with one of the core models of the business that perhaps they don't plan to have forever, but is making operations work today? Yeah, they start, you know, cease and desist letters start flowing in. And they, I think, kind of in a smart way, start using those conversations with brands to try to use them as, uh, you know, to educate them on what they're doing. It's like a new business opportunity. You sent us a cease and desist letter. We're going to actually come in and pitch you on being a partner. Yeah, I talked to someone who worked on sort of the fashion business and and the apparel brands. And she said, like, 
she's like, we converted a bunch of these people, but still, I think, I think overall, I think it was probably more negative than positive, the outcome of that. So they're dealing with that. Sales are going crazy, seems pretty good, but having to spend a ton of money on advertising, this model of buying merchandise from other retailers at retail cost, but then selling it for less, um, just, you know, the math was not really working out. Right. So this is when Lori goes out to find more investment because he believes that there is a sustainable model here. There is a business plan or rather a business model. They just need to get through this difficult launch phase, work out these, you know, growing pains. He does end up going out. I think one investment falls through. He ends up getting another pretty sizable one. But this path to a more sustainable business seems so distant. What were you making of the company's prospects at the time? I think if it was a first time entrepreneur, I think the press would have been even harsher. I think I was skeptical it could work. That said, like the idea of rewarding customers for stripping, you know, costs out of the supply chain or logistics back end, like that did make sense. And, you know, in talking to executives for my book, they bought that too, because in, in theory, that should make sense at the right scale. And Mark just kept preaching, you know, it's just it's just math. At twenty billion dollars in what they call GMV, basically gross merchandise value, um, gross sales, like the math will work. Are we an Amazon killer? I mean, the market's massive, plenty of room for many players. And again, we're not the ones, you know, competing direct with Amazon and Walmart and these big players. It's really our merchant partners that are competing, and we're just enabling them to compete in a better, more efficient way. We just need to raise the money to grow to that level. And, you know, a lot of it was just through paid advertising, frankly. So they had they had a TV, they had this TV ad with like a comedian's head exploding. It's the biggest thing in shopping since the Internet. Shopping in the web? I don't remember what the point was there. I think the savings were so great. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Mind blowing savings. I think subway and and bus ads in New York and San Francisco, like they were they were going all out. At this point, I think it was a hundred, few hundred million dollars. Few hundred, few hundred million. Which, which to be fair, at that point, I mean, it's still a lot of money. But like at that point in sort of e-commerce and retail world, like for a one-year-old company or a six-month-old, like that was an astronomical amount of money. Executives at Jet weren't so sure the company would make it through the holiday shopping season, but there was one thing motivating Mark Laurie. That was the opportunity he saw to create a real challenger to Amazon's number one position in e-commerce. He felt he and his team could nab that second place. And at the time, at least, Walmart, for as big of a retail company as a what biggest retailer in the world, really had a shitty online presence. So... There was this big market, the market was growing, and there was no clear-cut number two player, and Jack could be that. Meanwhile, that other company, Walmart, was eager to find its place online and capture the market that Jet was going after. We'll hear that story after the break. After a splashy summer launch, Mark Laurie faced the holiday season looking for investment that would help him keep up with the advertising he felt was needed to boost sales. He made his pitch for that simple math over and over. More investment meant he could spend more in marketing and reach the critical point in gross sales that would give the company a profit, eventually. And in the spring of 2016, Laurie took a meeting with another potential investor. So one of Mark's board members introduces him to Doug McMillan. Doug McMillan, while not a household name, is one of the most powerful people in the world. That's because he's the CEO of Walmart. And Doug grew up inside that company, became CEO of Walmart in 2014. So right around the time Jet was starting to get going. And this board member introduces Mark to Doug and it's kind of like you guys might have some things in common might have a common enemy um, maybe you could work together and so Doug and Mark meet I think I think their meet, first meeting took place 
inside what's called the Quail Room at Walmart headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, Sam Walton, Walmart's founder, was a big quail hunter. And so the conversation starts with sort of investment talk. Maybe Walmart could invest in Jet, but not in sort of a typical like venture capital way. Maybe they can help Jet in other ways in exchange for equity in their startup. Maybe Walmart could help Jet work out better rates with FedEx for shipping orders. Maybe the legacy retailer could help the startup negotiate better terms with the big consumer products or CPG companies. And so these two guys from different backgrounds, sort of both like personal life and corporate life, they kind of hit it off. Could you tell me a little bit more about how different these guys were in terms of their personal backgrounds? Doug McMillan, uh, sort of what I call the hometown boy at, at Walmart, he grew up part of his childhood in, in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and then his family moved to Bentonville, where Walmart is based uh, in his teenage years, worked in a wareha- Walmart warehouse in high school, basically spent his has spent his entire career there. He's an Arkansas boy, smart guy, MBA, uh, but really, like, that's all he knows is is sort of the Walmart experience and the Arkansas experience. Because I think for anybody who's not been to Bentonville, like Walmart is Bentonville. For many people who live in the town, they're there because of Walmart, whatever piece of the company they might work in. That's exactly right. So that's the world that Doug McMillan knows. And just briefly, how does that contrast with Lori's world? Lori is, you know... An East Coast guy, I don't know, he looks like a tough New York guy is the best way I could describe it. You talk to him, he's more soft, soft-spoken, soft but, you know, he's burly, I don't know, New York, I, I'm from New York and now live in New Jersey. Like, he's a New York, New Jersey, <laughs> when you think New York, New Jersey, like Mark Laurie's kind of what you expect. And he's an entrepreneurial hustler. And on the surface, at least, you know, very different people that you might not guess would hit it off. What was it in that early meeting that McMillan might have seen in Lori? So he didn't quite express it to me this way, but I, from talking to others, I think he saw glimmers of the entrepreneur that Sam Walton was, frankly. Not saying Mark Lori sort of on that level, a vision setter, a cheerleader. I think a lot of successful entrepreneurs could come across as sort of cocky or kind of an asshole. And that's not, you know, that's not how Mark com- comes across to most people. So down to earth guy, but also someone with this pretty successful track record and one who who was open to partnering with Walmart. I mean, that's the other thing to consider is that a lot of tech entrepreneurs look at Walmart as like, I don't know, old and backward. And why would we ever want to partner with them In the story so far, Lori needs quite a lot. What's McMillan trying to solve? He's trying to solve the fact that, you know, their e-commerce experience is, I mean, not only well below Amazon's shopping experience, but also the sales. They're growing in e-commerce, but everyone's growing in e-commerce. But the growth is going in the wrong direction. they're, They're growing more slowly than they had been. And I think, frankly, he didn't trust that he had the right leader at the time. And so... I think he was looking for leadership, but really he was looking for, man, Amazon is absolutely crushing us online. They might be actually stealing some of our best customers who are, you know, wanting to shop online. And if we don't do something quickly, yeah, it sounds crazy for Walmart not to exist, you know, but that might be the reality decades from now when e-commerce is maybe 50% of retail rather than just 10%. So how did the conversations between Lori and McMillan evolve from maybe there's a partnership or some initial investment here to maybe there's something more serious for us to be doing together? So this is another one where you get a different version depending on who you're talking to. Some would say it was just a natural evolution. But, you know, and Mark won't admit this. I think he was looking around corners and saying like, man, we need to raise a lot more money. And I'm really great at raising money, but we're so far from profitability. And here is this giant, amazing company in some ways, but one that is really desperate for what we have. And so my best guess is that Mark started to push 
the conversation in that direction. That said, there was also an M&A head, a corporate development head inside of Walmart who was talking to Doug McMillan in the background, kind of saying, man, we really need to figure something out to move faster. And if it's not acquiring Jet.com, what are we going to do? So McMillan, the corporate development head, some other people in senior leadership at Walmart see this as perhaps the answer to solving their e-commerce trouble. But the Walmart board is a very different picture. This is a group of people who have been sort of steering the direction or, or managing the direction of this brick and mortar physical space company for decades. What does Mark have to do to convince the board that this tie up that he sees opportunity with, that even the CEO sees opportunity with, that it is the right thing for the company? So Mark comes up with an idea. He decides he's going to put together um, sort of a a, a presentation with slides, but voicing it over and telling the story of how Jet actually reflects sort of the best of what Sam Walton stood for. And so he went back and I think read or says he read something like, you know, every Sam Walton shareholder letter and starts to sort of sell the narrative of, well, we are sort of a new type of retail, we, our DNA is sort of the Walton and Walmart DNA, figuring out new ways for customers to save, really being the number one thing, and just, you know, having a real appreciation for making customer lives easier, uh, mainly through low prices. And it seems to have worked. The quest to stop Amazon from total domination continues, this time in the form of Walmart buying Jet.com. Walmart and a $3.3 billion deal that's the biggest ever purchase of a U.S. e-commerce startup and a sign Walmart is gearing up to make online shopping a primary part of its growth strategy. Joining us to discuss... Okay, let's understand that sometimes people just say, you know what, I'd rather buy than build. Sometimes they just say, you know, we have the blank check, we have the backing of the family, let's just go buy a site that can come in under Amazon. And you know what? America loves a bargain. Is, is this really one of the biggest aqua hires in history? Oh, yeah, absolutely. really after an individual? Yes, it is. Mark Lurie. If I'm not mistaken, news of the deal had sort of leaked out during this time. They were frantically, furiously trying to get this deal done quite quickly, putting on the finishing touches. But you were the one who broke the news of the value of the deal, that it had actually been agreed. Just tell us about what you learned about how those final days came together when the deal was inked. Yeah. So Walmart, this comes up many times in, you know, in my reporting and in my book, where even when they commit to a big deal and you can kind of understand it, like they don't move very quickly to actually close the deal. And so they're kind of taking their time. And then and then there is a, a news report, I believe in the Wall Street Journal, that says these companies are in discussions. Uh, I am pissed. <laughs> and I decide at a minimum, I need to follow up and nail this, that this deal is either happening or not. And when I am able to do that, and I publish, I think it was on a Sunday in August of 2016, that the deal was being announced the next morning. And that would be, you know, a $3 billion plus acquisition price. In the period between my, me publishing that and the first press leak, they start working faster. And there's this great scene in my book, but also that happened in real life, Mm -hmm. in which Mark Laurie and some of his executives are at a New York City loft department of one of the executives. They are in the final stages of trying to figure out how all their employees will fit into the Walmart sort of compensation and title, you know, role title uh, matrix. And Mark is still hammering out the final details with Doug McMillan himself. And he's uh, trying to find space in the apartment where no one is. And he ends up in a bedroom of of one of his executive's kids. The kid comes home from school and walks into her bedroom. And there's this weird dude laying across her bed with his, I think it was cowboy boots or some type of boots up on her headrest. So I don't know what that says other than that he was comfortable while he was negotiating this 
really life changing to deal for so many people. And so that's a few days before it ends up being announced. Yeah. To your point about what does that say about where he what he was doing, you know, in this teenager's bedroom finishing the deal. To me, it reveals that a lot of these big deals get decided in really strange places. We think of these sort of mahogany sided <laughs> boardrooms, but actually sometimes it's just a phone call between two people and one of them might be in somebody's bedroom. That I mean, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, when I first got into reporting and, you know, business reporting, I I I believe that until, you know, stories like this sort of bring to life that these are normal people trying to get stuff done wherever and whenever they can. And um, maybe not many of them happen in a random teenager's bedroom, but I'm sure there are a lot weirder places than that. Oh, I'm sure. Um, So as with most acquisitions, I think executives, especially the two CEOs, can paint a pretty rosy picture about what's to come. But like the proof is really in what happens after closing when reality sets in. So Jet comes in meant to be the answer to Walmart's digital woes Walmart is providing this company with the kind of cash and support it needs to potentially become this competitor with Amazon. But what really happens in the years after this acquisition closes? So one thing Walmart assured the Jet founders of and leadership team and what was really important to Mark Laurie and his team was that they would come in and really be given the freedom to do whatever they want with walmart.com's e-commerce business in the U.S. So Mark is, you know, one of the first things they're trying to do is launch two-day shipping without a membership fee to try to combat Prime. And I think Mark said at the time, it was announced a few months after his team took over, he said, two-day shipping is now table stakes. Like, we have to be doing it. So they're moving fast and they're trying to roll out stuff that they feel is just to be any sort of player in online shopping you need to do. Let alone a leader. Let alone a leader. What would happen over time, though, is that a lot of their biggest ideas, everything from acquiring some sort of cool digital native brands like the menswear brand Bonobos to coming up with experimental business models like ordering through text message Uh, through the creation of an internal startup that was called Jet Black. They were trying to do these things to um, either appeal to different customers that Walmart typically didn't or learn something about new technologies. Sort of the leadership team in Bentonville is looking at these as outside of our core business, not about our core customer, and costly. And if there's something a long-term Walmart leader hates is not turning a profit on a new business idea. I mean, the company leaders, Wall Street investors, they expect, yeah, growth is a, is cool, but like they expect profits. And so Mark and team are coming out with all these new ideas, which are really unprofitable. Yes, the walmart.com shopping experience is getting a little better. Delivery speeds are increasing. But internally, the leaders of Walmart's store business, the CFO, they're kind of like, man, these these guys do not know how to make money. And we're Walmart. We make money. We're rewarded for making money. And so that that becomes big friction inside the company. The story of what happened when Jet became part of Walmart is a great example of the challenge of trying to innovate at a company that's been around for generations. Newcomers, in this case Amazon, can convince investors that growth is a key metric of success, while shareholders of reliable companies like Walmart are looking for profit. That's hard to do when you're trying to invest in something new. Walmart eventually closed down Jet in 2020, and Lori left the company in 2021. I think Walmart is now a clear number two in the U.S. in online retail in a way that they were definitely not pre-jet acquisition. Where it gets hairy is assigning credit. I do think Mark and his team get credit for creating urgency in rolling things out faster, in trying new things that maybe failed, but maybe you did learn a couple of new things. 
That said, I think a lot of the store executive team really get the credit for their massively successful pickup business, which continues to be successful. I used it recently, and I, you know, they have 15 spots in the parking lot dedicated. They were all full. That's probably, you know, that's a good sign for them. But the pandemic gets some credit here, too. They either could fulfill demand that so many people had or really disappoint people at the worst possible time. And so it's a combination of things. And I still run into people who want my opinion on was the jet deal smart or not. And my unsatisfactory answer to some is depends on what your definition of success is. If it is changing the narrative of Walmart on Wall Street and in tech hiring circles, success. If it is creating an urgency to roll out new products and services to digital customers faster, success. Their acquisition strategy, though, and, you know, did we get our money's worth on spending hundreds of million dollars to bring in new entrepreneurs and new types of businesses? Failure. Did we grow e-commerce sales outside of that pickup business in a way that was profitable and or close enough to profitable that you could see a path to profits, kind of a failure. And so it's a messy picture, but it's hard to say they are in a worse place today than they were pre-jet acquisition. And so if they could do it over again, I think they probably would. I guess it just reveals that it's a very messy, very complicated road to be in competition with Amazon. I mean, 100%. And that's not only in e-commerce, but in... Just about everything. (laughs) Just about everything. Jason Delray, thank you so much for being on The Closer. Thanks for having me. That's the end of the episode. But there's more from my conversation with Jason Del Rey. We go in-depth on more of the friction between Jet's digital-first approach and Walmart's legacy business, and what one former exec of the Arkansas giant had to say about what the Jet acquisition could have been. Just to get this raw, candid customer point of view from someone who grew up inside the company and was a champion of everything that Walmart stands for. This guy who loves Walmart is super frustrated by the lack of speed of their transformation. And so that sort of just told me they they really do have a long way to go. You can hear the rest of my extended conversation with Jason on Brazen Plus on Apple Podcasts. The Closer is a production of Project Brazen in partnership with PRX. Our show is produced by Isabel Kirby McGowan and Anna Muto. Ben Walsh is our reporter. Marianne Hell Gonzalez is our project manager. And Lucy Woods is head of research. Megan Dean is programming manager. And Ryan Ho is design lead. Golda Arthur is our showrunner. And Bradley Hope and Tom Wright are executive producers. Our marketing consultant is Maggie Taylor. I'm Amy Keene. Thanks for listening.